First of all, I like to say Mabruk to Uria uh, for uh, the publication of his uh, three books. Um, this session is about uh, Muslim uh, minorities in uh, the West, and we have uh, six speakers, so please uh, take care of this uh, in your talking. Um, I like to invite uh, the uh, speakers, uh, first of all, Galia Sapar and uh, then Ismail Malik um, and Joyce Van de Bilt, uh, Teresa uh, Harrings, uh, Morang uh, Thorant, uh, and Amikam uh, Nachman. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Galia Sabar. Uh, Galia Sabar is a professor uh, of African Studies in, at Tel Aviv University. In the past uh, 20 years, her research fo focused on uh, African migration to Israel, uh, with special emphasis on African labor migrants uh, from West uh, Africa and African uh, asylum uh, seekers. Uh, from uh, Sudan and Eritrea. Her research uh, also includes patterns of return migration. Uh, Sabar uh, has published uh, seven books and dozens of articles in uh, professional uh, journals. Recently, together with uh, Professor Uriah Shavit, she led an interdisciplinary uh, comparative research group uh, on theologies of migrations. In addition to her uh, academic research, Professor Sabar has uh, been a leading uh, a social activist in uh, Israel, mainly in re relation to Ethiopian immigrants, uh, as well as uh, in partnership with uh, various uh, NGO uh, assisting African labor uh, migrants and uh, Islam uh, seekers. Um, in May uh, 2009, uh, in recognition of her uh, work combining uh, academic rigor uh, with social activism, Professor Sabah received the uh, Unsung uh, Heroes of uh, Composition Award by the Dalai Lama. Professor Sabah, please. Well, it's really a pleasure to be here, and as all the others, I do join uh, Uriah in congratulating you for all your wonderful achievements and publications. Well, nowadays, everybody is talking about the migrant crisis. Politicians, journalists, common men and women, academics, everybody is trying to say something smart about what's going on. So many people have just now woken up, you know, and we say, hello, where have you been all these years? Where have you been, you know, looking at various migration waves before? So probably the first question that has to be asked is, why is it that suddenly everybody in the West is talking about the migration? Why is everybody suddenly interested in what's happening in Syria, in Eritrea, in Sudan, in Afghanistan? Well, I'm absolutely sure that within this room we all have some of the answers, at least, you know, uh, the fact that until the moment when the victims of the atrocities, the civil wars, the moment they came to the front and to the backyard of Europe, that's when everybody started to speak about it. When the growing numbers were so vast that people could not just turn a blind eye, they started to ask what's happening around us. And mainly the question is, when is this going to end? Well, honestly, I'm not sure I myself can give a clear and logical conceptualization of what is going on right now but I will try and offer some observations 
that I think might help us think or rather make sense of the current waves of migrants worldwide and especially those huge migration waves to Europe. Now I will start with seven general takes on migration trends in the 21st century and then offer additional seven insights on the current wave of asylum seekers. You're probably going to ask why seven, then seven is a number that symbolizes good luck. And I think that when we're speaking about migration, asylum seekers, refugees, and also our work in the academic world, luck is something we all need. So the first insight I would like to offer is that maybe it's trivial, but I think we have to state it. Migration has always been part of human history. Hence, in spite of what some politicians worldwide would like to think, I would like to say that migration is here and here to stay. So let's tackle the fact that it's here and it's going to be with us. In 2014, we are speaking about 260 million people that have been identified as migrants. And I've put down the broader definition of what is migration. And obviously, we all know that there are different kinds of migration, first voluntary and then forced migration. But within each of these groups, there are, again, distinct classifications. But when we look at this number, 260 million people, we suddenly have to ask ourselves, is this a large number? Is this a small number? You know, how can we make sense of this number? So I think that the additional uh, um, data that we need is to see that all in all, it's a very small percentage of the people living around the world. It's less than 4%. And even if these numbers are not exactly accurate, because it's extremely difficult to count the number of migrants, still percentage-wide, it's a very small number. However, what is significant to see is that 72% of these migrants are in these critical uh, uh, year span between the ages of 20 and 46. And obviously, it's the most productive years of humankind, both for women and for men, in the sense of labor and, uh, and productivity in all other uh, ways. When we look at migration worldwide, we can look at Europe and Asia and see that in spite of the fact that everybody now is speaking about Europe, both Europe and Asia have together only 66% of the total uh, number of migrants. And the rest are within the African continent and just the minorities are in the other areas. And Europe and Asia probably bear the same burden of uh, migrants worldwide. Now within the European continent or within Europe, we can see that Germany and recently Greece have the largest numbers of migrants. Some of them are just passing through, but others are settling. But that is probably the two uh, countries that have uh, the most. And yet, the largest corridor of migration in the Western uh, world is between the US and Mexico. And every year, every year, at least one million people cross illegally the border between these two countries. And if I open large parentheses, the border between the US and Mexico is probably the most, um, what, how should I say, the, the, the best high tech, you know, all the technology to stop the migrants is being uh, uh, carried out there. And yet, when the push and pull factors are extremely high, um, it doesn't really uh, enable uh, those that want to uh, cross to stop. But in spite of the fact that this is the largest migration corridor, what we are now speaking about is a new large corridor, and that is the Mediterranean Basin. And that is the corridor that really interests us in the debate about Muslim migration in the West. And when we look at the Mediterranean Basin, we have to see the established and very veteran routes of migration from North Africa, from Central Africa, from West Africa, through North Africa to the Middle East and via the Mediterranean. But we also have to look at the uh, recent migration uh, corridors, and that is mainly the one from Eastern uh, uh, Africa, the Horn of Africa, from Somali 
Ethiopia, Eritrea, Sudan, and Egypt. And we also now have to see uh, the new corridor that comes via uh, Turkey, from Syria via Turkey to Greece, Italy, and going up to the uh, northern or to the Scandinavian country. So the Mediterranean basin has become, in the past, let's say, 20 years, both a hub and a destination for uh, hundreds and thousands of migrants uh, from around uh, its uh, area. The second insight that I would like to offer is that since the end of World War II, all countries around the world, except two, are both a receiving uh, and uh, a sending country and a receiving country. Now, uh, what are the two countries that are only sending migrants out? North Korea is one, and Eritrea is the other one. But other than that, all countries. And one of the things that I was really amazed, you know, I know the maps, I know these figures, but when I went to South Sudan to study the South Sudanese who were returned from Israel back home, the thing that amazed me that South Sudan is attracting migrants. Okay, so the country that we're speaking about it in terms of catastrophe and all that is still a very attractive country. I want to share with you uh, an amazing site, I think, that is done by the IOM, and that is uh, a map of the world, and here we can see an in and then we can have an out. If we want to look at America, we know that America is a destination, or the U.S. is a destination that attracts millions of people, and then you can see, you know, from what countries people uh, opt to migrate to the U.S., but let's take other countries that we don't really relate to them as countries that uh, attract migrants. Let's take Egypt, for example, and we can see that Egypt, again, is a country that attracts millions and millions of migrants. In other words, if we want to look at the Indian subcontinent and so on and so forth. So in other words, we really have to uh, look at the issue of migration in a much broader way and to think that any policy, that any country will uh, adopt against migrants in some way can be implemented against its own citizens because they are also leaving their own countries. The third insight, general insight, that today most developed countries have become multi-ethnic. Now stating that may seem to be obvious, but what's interesting is the consequences to this multi-ethnic character of the countries. And actually what we have to look at is how um, multi-ethnicity or multi-culti is really challenging the all state apparatus, the health system, the education system. How can a teacher handle a class where all or almost all its students are non-native speakers? How does the health system tackles issues of hygiene, of taking care of children and other issues. So these are all challenging issues to all state apparatus in the entire developing world. The fourth insight is related to migration and economy. Now I think that everybody would agree to, with me that most of the debate over migration and economy is usually framed in terms of financial burden on the receiving countries. How much is it going to cost us is the main issue or the main question. However, we do know that recent studies, and the latest one is the OECD report of 2014, both micro and micro uh, studies have shown that migration has also positive effect on the receiving countries' economy systems, especially in those countries with low birth rates, and obviously the Scandinavian countries are amongst them. So again, we can refer to one of the first things that I said, that 72% of the migrants today are between these ages of 20 and 46, the most productive uh, age for the uh, workforce. So we have to look at the economic gains, both to the receiving countries, but also to the sending countries. And if we are trying to look at uh, ways and means to try and a little bit not stop migration but control migration, then we have to see how we can empower the sending countries and obviously those who have already migrated, migrated and are sending their remittances back home. This is a very, very crucial factor in understanding migration and economy. The fifth insight would be the feminization of migration. 
Uh, up until about 20 years, most labor migrants, asylum seekers, and strong, uh, uh, and strong asylums that have managed to flee out of their own countries were usually men and young men. But in recent years, 52% of world migrants are women. So there is a clear shift in, uh, in that. So we have to ask, is this an empowering uh, experience for women, the ability to migrate either voluntarily or they escape? Does that empower them or it weakens them? So there is a, a, a debate within the literature, but it's very important to, to see the changing character of the composition of who is migrating and who is being forced to migrate or voluntary migrating. The sixth insight has to do with the criminalization of migration, and this has two uh, main uh, uh, aspects. The first is that uh, when we're speaking about these huge waves of migration and whatever stand we take about the reasons for migrating and all that, we have to look that within this uh, thirst and, 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 and will of the people to find a new place, uh, the will to survive, there's also a criminalization of migration in the sense that there is a lot of human trafficking. There is a lot to do with uh, uh, human smugglers. Uh, we were exposed to that uh, when we were looking at what's happening in Libya uh, in recent years. There's rampant economic and sexual abuse of uh, mainly asylum seekers, mainly women uh, are uh, abused. But also when we speak about criminalization of migration, we have to look at the language, at the discourse that people are using when they speak mainly about this current wave of asylum seekers. And refugees and asylum seekers are described by politicians, by journalists, from all uh, parties involved uh, with a, using a criminal vocabulary. They're being seen as a threat. Uh, we have to control them. They're a liability. Uh, in Hebrew, it's very, very clear using the term infiltrator, Mr. Nen, uh, to describe the African asylum seekers. Um, a lot of times we, uh, people are speaking about the refugees in terms of uh, a potential terrorist. So this criminalization of, uh, of the discourse on migrants and migrants themselves is a very, very uh, challenging phenomena we have to face. And finally, these first seven insight, I think that we have to see in, in like in the past 20 or 30 years, migration has really been possible within uh, the EU thanks to the blurring of national borders in the sense that it was easier uh, for people to move within the EU. So that is on the one hand, but on the, at the same time, this uh, enabling of movement of people within the EU has reinforced nationalism and xenophobia. And we see in the past uh, several elections, let's say in the past 10 years, that the right-wing xenophobic parties in all European countries have either uh, uh, doubled or tripled uh, their powers or even uh, are able to be part of the uh, official government, like in, in Serbia and in uh, Macedonia and what was just happening now in France and in Greece I think is a very, very uh, alarming and yet interesting and challenging phenomena we have to look at. So having said these seven general insights that are really true both to the voluntary labor migration uh, uh, worldwide but also to some of the forced uh, migration, I would like now to specifically look at the asylum seekers uh, uh, that we are now really facing or Europe is now uh, awakened to look at. So one of the things that we have to remember that most refugees never leave their countries. So in spite of the fact that we think that there's, it's a tsunami of refugees that is going to wash the European continent, we really have to see that in 2015, 60 million people around the world are displaced, forced to leave their homes due to conflict and unable for the moment to return, but 75% of them are actually IDP, internally displaced people. So they remain within their own countries or at the most they cross the border to refugee uh, camps nearby. So these uh, um, vast waves that we think that we see now in Europe are really the tip of the uh, uh, iceberg 
of this phenomena of uh, asylum seekers. And if you want to see that in, in a more clear way, we can see the number of refugees vis-a-vis uh, -vis the number of IDPs, and we can really see the total, uh, the, the refugees and the IDPs, it's almost 50% higher. The second insight would be that refugees are a recurrent, or, or this, what we are seeing now is a recurrent crisis, not a constant one. We do have, over the past 20 years, peaks. We can see in the 1990s, around the Balkan War and the uh, um, genocide in Rwanda, we can see a peak of, of refugees uh, coming to uh, European countries. And obviously, what we are facing now is the largest uh, wave of uh, asylum seekers since the end of World War II. But yet, it's a recurring crisis and not something that is constantly on the rise. The third general, I think, insight that we th should think about is that most refugees arrive by land and not by boat. You know, the images that we see about the boatmen, the boat people, is very, very uh, strong. But all in all, if we look at the numbers, then we can see that the total of those who have crossed uh, 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 through, um, through the land is much higher than the uh, boat people. And this really poses a lot of challenges to the EU mainly, you know, how to regulate, if to regulate, uh, uh, where to put or where to invest uh, your funds, your resources uh, in the regulation processes. Again, linking to one of the points that I've said earlier, when we look at the current uh, wave of asylum seekers, uh, we can look at a multinational, multi-ethnic, multi-religious composition of asylum seekers, although truly uh, the vast majority, uh, about 50% are from Syria and Muslim. But still, it's not the Syrian crisis. We really have to look at it at a much broader uh, perspective than just the Syrian crisis. Few Western countries see relatively few refugees. And again, we in the West think that we are under attack, under a tsunami. But of the countries that receive the most refugees, no European or North American country even makes the top 10. And the countries that bear the, the, the highest burden of receiving refugees and asylum seekers are Turkey, Pakistan, Lebanon, uh, Ethiopia, and then you can see Jordan, Kenya, Chad, Uganda, and China. So there's no European country amongst the 10 countries that observe the highest number of refugees. And yet, most of the discourse about the burden and what can we do is generated in the West. Um, when we look at Western countries, even in 2015, we are seeing small and manageable number of refugees. And even when we look at what's going on in Germany, in Sweden, in Norway, Denmark, those countries that have just recently in the past week produced uh, very disturbing uh, statements about what is the future of their policy vis-a-vis -vis asylum seekers, we can see that almost six out of 10 refugees in Europe today are settling in Sweden or Germany despite the fact that all Western countries are equally obliged to accept refugees according to the EU Convention, especially the Schengen Convention. So um, what is going on in Europe is a very interesting question because it really goes back to the whole rationale of the EU and the sharing of responsibility and burden. And obviously what we are seeing nowadays is not a sharing uh, process. And in this map you can see where the um, uh, darker green is is the countries that really bear the, the highest burden. And obviously, it's Germany, France, and as I said before, Greece and some of the Scandinavian uh, countries. Tougher policing doesn't reduce numbers, but it does kill more asylum seekers. And this would go back to my first insight, and that was migration is here and here to stay. And when we look at the European policy in the past few years, we can see a very, very interesting data that once the Mare Nostrum uh, uh, policy was uh, in place, we can see between uh, uh, 
the beginning of 2014, we can see the number of refugee and migrants who crossed the central Mediterranean with a more relaxed policy of the EU, with their, the, the uh, Mare Nostrum uh, um, patrols uh, within the Mediterranean, with a more uh, um, humanitarian attitude. Whereas in 2015, we have Operation Triton, which is basically to block the Mediterranean, and we see that it hasn't reduced the number of asylum seekers that are trying to cross the Mediterranean, but it did cost migrants death. Uh, there is an increase of hundreds percent within this one year of people who have died uh, in the Mediterranean. So this uh, tightening of policies doesn't really work to stop uh, the asylum seekers from uh, coming and crossing the Mediterranean. And the final insight that I would like to think about it with you is that the massive flow of information that we have. We are bombarded with information about this current wave of migration. But most of the information, we the refugees and asylum seekers, focuses on numbers, on routes, on push and pull factors, which are the magic word in migration studies. We, are, uh, we hear about laws and regulations and intimidations uh, uh, towards these asylum seekers, but very little attention in the public discourse and even in research is given to issues such as the social life, the love, the leisure, the economic entrepreneurship, arts, innovation. This is not by chance. This is not something that we can ignore. This is trying to put asylum seekers and migrants in the uh, a very unique cubicle that they don't have, they're not agents of their own uh, destiny because it's easier for us to try and think that we can control these people. So finally, we are truly right now as we are sitting here in the midst of what we are trying to understand, what we are trying to conceptualize and it's extremely difficult. And as I said, in spite of the massive flows of information, we are at a stage that I don't think that we are able to truly conceptualize, hence we are unable to really make sense. And what it causes is, it leads to greater fear, to violence, to exploitation, and less compassion. And I would like to say again, let's remember that migration is here and here to stay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Sabah. Uh, our 